The last time we met, we talked about the English Reformation, the Church of England, and the union of church and state. The state in the form of the monarchy, the church under the rule of the episcopacy or the bishops, they tried to keep a firm grip on the faith of the English people. But as you know, you cannot coerce faith. And so at the time that the Reformation was developing in England, dissent accompanied it. And so that's our discussion today, the rise and fall of dissent in England. The illustration here is a tragic story of three women, a mother and her two daughters, who were executed on the same day because of their Protestant faith. They were executed in 1556 under the reign of Bloody Mary. What makes this story unique is that one of the younger women actually was pregnant. As John Fox described her, she was great with child. And at the point of her execution, uh, it, John Fox says, the belly of the woman burst asunder by the vehemence of the flame. And the infant, being a fair man-child, fell on the fire. Well, the baby was rescued by an onlooker, but the bailiff actually threw the infant back onto the fire to kill the child along with her mother and the other two women. Well, this of course is a very dramatic <clears throat> story of persecution in England. There are many other stories to tell and we will tell some along the way. All right, well, we think of English descent as being generated by the Protestants, but there was Catholic resistance to the Church of England as well. There were Anglo-Catholics who remained in the Church of England, but preferred only the Catholic views in the prayer book. We talked about how Elizabeth's version of the Book of Common Prayer could accommodate them. But there were the more extreme uh, dissenters among the Catholics that are known as recusants. And they refused to abide by the prayer book and held illegal worship services using Catholic liturgy. Some of the more wealthy Catholics could actually hire uh, a priest to live in their castle and uh, offer mass every day. But most of the dissenters were Protestants who wanted to take the Reformation much further than the Church of England would allow. The first group are known as the Puritans. And of course, we're familiar with this term, but often we do not realize the origin of the term. These Puritans advocated purification of the church. They advocated reform. They desired the purity of the church, but they remained within the Anglican church. They desired the theology and worship and polity, that is the governance of the church, to follow reformed patterns. The majority favored the rule by the presbytery. Now they accepted the Book of Common Prayer, but they often withdrew into their small groups to conduct, conduct worship as a church within the church. A more extreme group than the Puritans were the group known as the Separatists. They were founded by Robert Brown, and so their opponents referred to them as Brownists. You'll notice that uh, often a, a dissenting group or a sect will be called by the name of the founder. 
For example, in uh, the early church, uh, the group known as the Montanists were founded by Montanus and named after him. Uh, more recently, the Church of Christ, having been founded by Alexander Campbell, are called Campbellites. But usually, if a sect is called by the name of the founder, it's, it's intended to be an insult. The group themselves often refer to themselves differently. For example, the Montanists call themselves the New Prophecy, or the Campbellites are the Church of Christ. In this case, these are the Separatists who totally rejected the state-established Church of, of England, and they called for a separation of the true church, a gathering of professing believers that are joined together by covenant, not by uh, their geographic location or their uh, participation, their forced participation, I should say, in the parish uh, Anglican church. And so they held illegal meetings and rejected the use of the prayer book. You'll remember under the terms of the Elizabethan settlement, it was illegal to meet and not to use the prayer book. And so they were in danger of imprisonment and further persecution. Now, the separatists were Calvinistic uh, in their theology. They believed in predestination. Most of them retained infant baptism, and they called for a congregational polity. We should be very familiar with this because this is the polity followed by most Southern Baptist churches. According to congregational polity, there's no governments from outside the congregation. There's no hierarchy that uh, determines the uh, doctrine and uh, the practice of the church. Each congregation decides matters of faith and order, and each congregation calls, ordains, and supervises their own ministers, and they uh, enforce their own church discipline. Now, there were two kinds of separatists. There were the strict separatists that allowed no worship with the apostate Church of England. But then there were the milder semi-separatists who occasionally would participate in communion with the Church of England in order to comply with religious laws. And it is out of this separatist movement that came the Congregationalists and the Baptists. So let's take some time and look at the origin of the English Baptists. Now, there were two groups within the English Baptists. There were the General Baptists, uh, led by John Smith, Thomas Helwes, John Merton, and others. And then there were the Particular Baptists, uh, many names I could mention, but uh, really the uh, one of the earliest uh, was John Spilsbury. Notice in the illustration that uh, these Baptists uh, often were called Anabaptists by their opponents. All right, again, they are uh, accusing the English Baptists of the, of the same uh, enthusiasm and uh, radical uh, intent such as the uh, Anabaptist of Munster. All right, let's talk about John Smith. He was a Cambridge graduate, again, uh, this troublemaking school. Uh, he began as an Anglican, but at school he became a Puritan. Then after graduation, when he began preaching in his hometown, he took his, uh, his religion to another level and he formed a separatist congregation in 1606. Now this separatist congregation grew so large that they were concerned that they might be discovered. And so they divided into two groups and a second branch 
was formed that met at Scrooby Manor. Their leaders included William Brewster, William Bradford, and Pastor John Robinson. These names may sound familiar to you. Yes, these are part of the group that came to America on the Mayflower. From Scrooby Manor, they, uh, they traveled uh, to Leyden, Netherlands in order to avoid uh, the persecution in England, and from there they traveled to the New World on the Mayflower. We'll talk more about them later, but I wanted to make that connection uh, between the, uh, the Mayflower congregation and John Smith's congregation in Gainsborough. Well, in 1608, John Smith's congregation uh, also fled the persecution in England and they moved to Amsterdam. They lived in a bakery owned by Mennonites. They lived on the, uh, on the top floor and in 1609, they reformed their uh, congregation under the New Testament model following believers' baptism. Now, here's how this transpired. As separatists, they had felt uneasy about the validity of their baptism because it originated in the Church of England that they considered to be apostate. And so as they considered their baptism, they were not only concerned about the uh, ad administration by the apostate church, but they began to study the Bible and realized that baptism was not for infants, but they were, but baptism is for believers. And so we've already looked at these scriptures uh, when we talked about the Anabaptists, but of course, anytime you read the Bible, uh, you're going to come to the conclusion that baptism is for believers and not for infants. Again, think about the importance of the English Bible, that they had the Word of God available to them in their own language, and therefore uh, they came to the biblical conclusion of believers' baptism. Now, in the recovery of believers' baptism, what are they to do? Who will baptize them? There was no one in the congregation who had been baptized as a believer, and so Smith baptized himself. Baptism was by pouring at this time, and then he baptized the others. But a few weeks later, he began to doubt the validity of, uh, of what we call say baptism or self baptism, and so he looked around and realized, oh, there's a group of Mennonites here. They are baptized believers. Why don't we join their congregation? So he and the Mennonites began a negotiating uh, membership in the congregation, but of course there were different beliefs between sep uh, English separatists and Dutch Mennonites. And in 1612, John Smith died without having been accepted himself into the church, but many of his followers joined uh, soon thereafter. Now, Smith's congregation often is considered to be the first Baptist church in modern times. Now, Thomas Helwes uh, was John Smith's co-pastor, uh, and Thomas Helwes disagreed with Smith's decision to join the Mennonites. Uh, Helwes came from a wealthy family. He's the one who financed their trip to Amsterdam, and he left his wife and children behind in England. But because the Mennonites had several different beliefs from uh, these uh, English uh, separatists, now English Baptists, remember Mennonites have a flawed Christology, uh, at the same time, they have uh, distinct beliefs about the magistracy and about pacifism. And so Helwes uh, did not want to become a part of the Mennonite church. And there were several others who felt the same way. And so Helwes became the pastor of this smaller remnant. In 1611, Thomas Helwes returned to England and settled in Spitalfield, London. 
By this time, his wife Joan was imprisoned as a separatist in England. And uh, Helwes formed the first Baptist church on English soil. Now, here again, we are going to uh, recognize that Baptists have taken a leading role in religious liberty. And Thomas Helwes in 1612 wrote a treatise titled The Mystery of Iniquity. This is the first plea for religious liberty written in the English language. I think that's important to remember, don't you? Now, he said that, the, that Christ is the head of the church, not the king. The king has no power over conscience. He wanted to present a copy of this treatise to uh, King James I, but he was not allowed to see the king, and so he wrote on the fly leaf and sent an inscribed copy to the king. And this is what uh, is said in part on that fly leaf. For men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it. Neither may the king be judged between God and man. Let them be heretics, Turks, Jews, or whatsoever. It appertains not to the earthly power to punish them in the least measure. And so notice that Helwes is not asking for religious liberty for Baptists alone. No, he wants uh, religious liberty for everyone. Uh, Muslims, Jews, heretics, uh, everyone should be free to follow his or her own conscience. Now, we can assume that uh, King James received his copy of Helwes's treatise because two weeks later, Helwes was arrested, placed in prison, where he died in 1616. The next pastor of this congregation was John Merton, and he's the author of another treatise uh, calling for religious liberty. The title is Humble Supplication, written in 1620. Now, how did he write it? This is an interesting story. He's in prison, and um, a jailer who is uh, sympathetic would bring a milk bottle to, uh, to Merton every day, and the bottle was stopped up by a piece of paper rolled up and stuffed into the neck of the bottle. Merton would pull out the paper, unroll it, he had a stick that he would dip into the milk and he'd write uh, letter by letter, word by word, as much as he could on this little strip of paper. He'd drink the milk, roll the paper back up and put it in the bottle, and then the jailer would carry it to the congregation. They would unroll that strip of paper and heat it over a candle and that would reveal the writing. Have you ever been a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout and tried that secret message? It works. And so little by little, uh, he smuggled out the words of his treatise until it was completed and then it was published. He said that, uh, that every citizen in England should submit to the king in civil matters but not in spiritual matters. The priesthood of believers gives competency to each individual in spiritual matters. Sadly, uh, John Merton died in Newgate Prison. Uh, dissent was not allowed in the Church of England. Now, John Merton, Thomas Helwes, John Smith, they belonged to a group of Baptists we call General Baptists because they believed in general atonement. That is, Christ died generally for all humans. Anyone who believes in Christ can be saved. 
Isn't it interesting that these general Baptists came out of the English separatist movement and they had held to a Calvinistic soteriology. That is, they believed in a limited atonement. But remember that they uh, spent a season in Amsterdam, Netherlands, and they formed their church in 1609, the same year that Jacob Arminius died. And so I believe that they came under the influence of Arminianism while they were in the Netherlands, and they adopted an Arminian soteriology that impacted and influenced their theology as general Baptists. Now, we need to make it clear that they taught a universal redemption. Everyone can be redeemed, but they did not teach universal salvation that everyone uh, will be saved. Now, there was another group of Baptists that developed later, and they're called Particular Baptists. They believed in a particular atonement. That is, Christ died particularly only for the elect. And so let's uh, discuss the development of Particular Baptists. In 1616, in Southwark, London, Henry Jacob formed a semi-separatist congregation. Historians call this congregation the JLJ Church after its first three pastors, Jacob, Lethrop, and Jesse. Now, of course, they didn't have a marquee out front of their building that said JLJ Church. In fact, they didn't have a marquee. In fact, they didn't have a church. They had to meet secretly in homes, just as the early Christians uh, did. But nonetheless, this congregation uh, developed over time, and there were a number of uh, splits uh, in this congregation, splitting over the, uh, uh, the issue of whether to be semi-separate or strictly separate. Uh, and so during the pastorates of Jacob Lathrop and Henry Jesse, there were a number of different congregations that developed out of the JLJ church. The strict separatists formed their own congregations and ultimately they rejected infant baptism by the Anglican Church, but they still retained covenant infant baptism as part of the true uh, separatist church. Eventually, however, among the particular Baptists came the leadership of John Spilsbury and Although there may have been other congregations ahead of him, we know for certain that he organized the first congregation of particular Baptists in 1638, nearly 30 years after John Smith's congregation. Uh, but nonetheless, even though the particular Baptists came later, they were the larger group. And because the particular Baptists had had no connection with the Arminianism of, of Christians in the Netherlands, they maintained their Calvinistic soteriology, teaching that Jesus died particularly for the elect, not all humanity. Uh, by 1644, there were seven uh, particular Baptist churches. They formed an association and issued the first London confession. Now, it was the particular Baptists who recovered the biblical doctrine of immersion. Again, reading the English Bible in their language, they came to the, uh, the biblical conclusion that immersion is the correct mode for baptism. Here are some scriptures, uh, Matthew and Mark, uh, describe Jesus' baptism, and it says that Jesus came out of the water when the dove descended on him. Uh, in John 3.23, it says that uh, uh, Jesus and his disciples were baptizing in a place where there was plenty of water. Even more specific is Acts 8, where Philip witnesses to the Ethiopian, and uh, the Ethiopian 
uh, confesses his faith in Jesus. He desires baptism. He sees water. And the, the account says that they went down into the water and they came up out of the water. But I think the most important scripture to support immersion is Romans 6, 4. In his letter to the Romans, uh, Paul teaches that we were buried with Christ through baptism into death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so Paul is saying that baptism is a picture of the believer's union with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Pouring and sprinkling do not communicate this union in the same way that immersion does. Pouring and sprinkling suggest cleansing, which is a part of our salvation experience, but only immersion pictures the total experience of salvation. And besides these scriptural supports, there's also the meaning of the word baptizo, which means to immerse. Outside of scripture, the word baptizo is used to describe a shipwreck going into the water or dyeing cloth, which obviously must be dipped into uh, the, the dye in order to uh, be changed. It, it is unfortunate that uh, uh, sprinkling and pouring was in use when the Bible first began to be translated into English. And in order to avoid the confusion uh, of uh, baptizo meaning immerse, uh, the translators simply avoided translating and they, they just transliterated baptizo into baptize. And so they left the uh, interpretation of the word to the readers. But uh, it is clear that the scripture teaches that baptism is by immersion. And so the particular Baptists decided this was the practice they wanted to follow. But again, they looked around and no one had been immersed as a believer. And so in 1641, one of the particular Baptist congregations sent Richard Blunt to the Netherlands. And he received a baptism by immersion from the Mennonites and he returned and baptized the others. In 1644, John Spilsbury practiced believers baptism by immersion, but he did not feel any need for a uh, baptismal succession and so he simply began baptizing by immersion which I think is the correct response to the issue. Now occasionally early baptisms were done naked. You can wake up now. Uh, often <laughs> my students uh, look up startled to hear me say that. Uh, in reality, of course, uh, even in the earliest churches, uh, baptism was conducted uh, naked. Uh, it's a beautiful picture where the, uh, the, the, the new believer removes the old life, is baptized and immersed and comes out of the water uh, in the same condition in which he or she was, uh, was born the first time. And thus the same way the second uh, birth. But then the, uh, the new believer is given a white robe to symbolize the new purity of life. Now, uh, in the early church, baptism was conducted separately from the congregation. And, uh, and I will say that in the early centuries, uh, public nudity was not the scandal then that it was now. Uh, in the Roman Empire, public baths were common. In England, however, uh, modesty uh, was very pronounced. And so these English Baptists, as they conducted uh, naked baptism in public, they were soundly criticized, perhaps rightfully so. At any rate, this, uh, this practice did not last long.
All right, let me just mention one other dissenting group, the Quakers. They were organized by George Fox in 1652. And again, they're called Quakers as an insult because of their spirit-led worship. But they refer to themselves as the Society of Friends. They emphasized the inner light of Christ in people's heart. They lived perfect lives in Christ by the direct inspiration and empowering and fullness of the Holy Spirit in the present age. And this probably describes the Quakers uh, best. The, uh, the idea of, of um, immediate revelation by the Holy Spirit. And so they rejected formal church organization. They did not ordain ministers. They simply allowed lay people to speak. They rejected external observ observance of ordinances. They rejected the use of creeds or confessions. They simply gathered uh, in their uh, uh, meeting houses and awaited the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit to move someone to speak. And that was how they conducted their worship services. But again, they were dissenting from the Church of England. They were meeting illegally uh, in their uh, own congregations. And so they were persecuted along with Baptists and other dissenting groups. Having introduced you to uh, some of our uh, dissenting groups, the recusant Catholics, the separatists, both the semi-separatists and strict separatists, uh, the Baptists, uh, particular and general, and now the Quakers. I'm going to bring this uh, lecture to a close and then pause before coming back when we'll talk about uh, the new king, James I, and the new Stuart dynasty and the troubles that the Stuart dynasty had with England. And so we have a uh, civil war up ahead and uh, uh, some new developments uh, on behalf of the dissenters. So until then, I bid you a uh, good day.